I know what you did. Hello and welcome to Cool Time Life. I'm your host, Steve Prentice. Each of our Cool Time Life podcasts focuses on a topic dealing with people, productivity and or technology, and each offers ideas and facts you need to know about to thrive in today's busy world. An index of our podcasts is available at steveprentice.com under the podcast tab. I know what you did. If someone said that to you in a menacing way, how would you feel? Where would your mind go? What terrible secret would your subconscious drag to the surface of your memory? This phrase, I know what you did, is enormously powerful, even though most of the time it holds no actual substance at all. People in power, especially political and religious leadership, use variations of this all the time. I know what you did is just one example of a phrase that allows a listener to fill in the blanks with their own thoughts and feelings. It's a leading statement. I can look at you and say, I know what you did without knowing a thing about you. Maybe I've not even met you before. But if I say it with enough conviction, you will do the rest of the work for me. Your conscience will fly to something that you did, something you are not proud of, and will assume that I somehow found out about it. You might even capitulate, allowing me to extend my dominance further, blackmailing you emotionally without ever knowing what your terrible secret actually is. All I have to do is say, I know what you did. Humans are terrible with handling emotion. We are slaves to it. As I have said in previous podcasts, we are ruled by emotion and not logic. Which is why so much of what people do is based on faith and not on knowledge. In fact, knowledge itself becomes a threat to people's faith, inspiring them to lash out in defense of what their emotions hold dear. People who feel guilty about something carry a heavy emotional burden. So heavy, in fact, that unless they are true sociopaths, devoid of the capacity to feel, they are likely to give away their own gain automatically. Shakespeare summed it up best in Hamlet with his quote, So full of artless jealousy is guilt, it spills itself for fear of being spilt. Guilt forces most people, anyway, to act differently, to always be watching out for a slip of their own tongue or a glint of recognition from someone else that the jig is up. It's an uncomfortable way to live. Police who investigate crimes in which more than one person is an accomplice often count on the guilt factor that one of the other accomplices will break and will come forward to spill the beans. So, back to the initial phrase, I know what you did. This is a term of influence. Not a nice form of influence, but influence just the same. Robert Caldini, whose book on influence, The Art of Persuasion, is one of the classics of the business, doesn't mention guilt as one of the six faces of influence, which is kind of weird because of how powerful and how ubiquitous it is. I had another look at the six faces on his list. Liking. People like to do things for people they like. No, that's way outside the guilt sphere. Reciprocity. Returning a favor or a good deed. No. Social proof. Doing things that you see others doing, like fashion trends. No guilt there. Commitment and consistency. Nope. That refers to trusting in people who stick with a style and give you comfort by not changing. How about scarcity? Order now. Supplies are limited. Nope. That might speak to your sense of urgency and self-preservation, but not guilt. So what about the last one? Authority. Deferring to an expert or someone in a position of authority. That's probably as close as this list gets, although I'd like to suggest that guilt goes on from there as number seven, since guilt can be generated from within oneself as much as from another authoritative being. Nevertheless, guilt and fear exist, and they influence us. Does guilt influence us from a survival and self-preservation standpoint? Do we seek to eliminate an enemy who knows our guilty secret in order to stay alive? Not really, or at least not always. It is likely more a proof of a moral conscience, that point of interference between fact and emotion guided by a self-developed sense of right and wrong that we have grown into socially over the centuries. Something that, by the way, is not uniquely human. Other higher-level creatures like elephants, dolphins, and certainly dogs appear to share this to some degree. But guilt drives many of our actions and certainly weighs heavy on our soul. So, back to the phrase, I know what you did. There are many, many examples, variations of this leading phrase. It's a phrase that allows you to fill in the blanks with your own belief, fear, and guilt. So as I said before, it is used a great deal in two areas where power over others is a stock in trade. 
One is politics and the other is religion. Not surprisingly, the two topics that everyone is warned against bringing up at family get-togethers. The President of the United States, Mr. Trump, is a master of this game and it is central to his appeal to his base. He has a large collection of statements that fit into this bucket. Here are just a few. Many people say, implies a majority consensus on a topic without ever having to justify who these people are. None of his followers will ever ask who these people are. This generality is sufficient to satisfy them that the remainder of his statement has been legitimized by these, quote, many people. Very, very big, very beautiful, very soon. These are terms that deliver comfort, which is an emotion and easily puts up a barrier between fact and feeling. When Mr. Trump promises delivery of something, be it more jobs or a border wall or salvation from a pandemic, his answer is vague yet comforting to his believers. Soon. It will happen soon. It will be good. You don't need to know more than that, and you certainly don't need to question me further. It's taken care of. Relax and be quiet. Another version of the I know what you did leading statement is the loaded question. What else is going on here? Is there something going on here? What is he hiding? These and many others like it are extremely successful in planting seeds of doubt and suspicion in the minds of listeners without actually coming out with a straight factual statement that runs the risk of being proven directly wrong. Doubt and suspicion are cousins of guilt. Emotions that feed on fear, which is the most powerful emotion of all. Mr. Trump has used this technique regularly and with great success to weaken his enemies. By asking questions about his opponent, is he a Muslim? Is he a terrorist sympathizer? Was he born in Kenya? I don't know, but there's something going on here. With words like that, he infects his opponent with attributes that touch the fear-based emotions of his followers while escaping accountability. Hey, I was just asking a question. This type of vaguely accusatory question goes back centuries, and it was a key tool of incrimination in the inquisitions of Europe and the real, actual witch hunts in the age of Puritans in America in the 1600s. The mere questioning statement about somebody being a witch was all that was needed to convict and ultimately execute. I'm not saying she's a witch, but... dot dot dot. It doesn't matter what happens after those dots. The die has now been cast. It is happening still in Ebola-stricken areas of Africa. It has been and continues to be the cause of much suffering and death throughout the centuries up to the present, when the word witch is replaced by the word homosexual. Sadly, the mob doesn't need facts, they just need the right collection of vague words and allusions to inflame their feelings of fear and translate them into destructive action. In pre-literate centuries, the primary megaphone for knowledge and social awareness in Europe and the New World was the church, which never missed an opportunity to impose this same guilt-inducing tactic when considering the many sins a person was capable of. They literally wrote the book on it. Virtually every memorable passage in the Bible, like turning water into wine, mutated from colloquial to miraculous, as people interpreted from that what they wanted to hear. Now we live in a post-literate age, where most people are able to read, but what they read merely supports their existing beliefs and fears. People who watch Fox News, for example, go there because they know the news they hear on this network will match their existing state of mind. They don't go there to learn facts, they go there to reinforce feelings. The same goes, by the way, for most other forms of informational media, left-leaning or right-leaning, socialist, liberal, conservative, or alt-right. We now go to the safe haven of a shared mindset, rather than pursue independent knowledge through critical thinking. Therefore, populist leaders like Mr. Trump and many others like him in politics as well as media personalities have flown like vultures into a perfect feeding ground where a receptive audience laps up vague statements and swaddles them in the context of their own fears. Those who choose to actively question the vagueness are dismissed as enemies of the state and hence enemies of that audience. Mr. Trump will not be the last political leader to use these vague leading statements as a pillar of his platform. He has, however, been the most successful, having spent decades in the private sector selling the sizzle rather than the stake in so many of his grandiose temporary ventures. The churches and megachurches of the United States and beyond echo with the same oratory, speaking to each individual directly, not via a statement of fact, but with a needle that touches each individual's soul, each in a highly specific, unmistakable, unforgettable way. This is its ultimate success factor. It doesn't need to say something, it just needs to convey the spark that touches upon the tinderbox of fear and guilt that we all privately hold. 
By the time the more intellectual, educated opponents have had their say and have eloquently presented a factual rebuttal, the ears and eyes and soul of the audience have been sewn up tight and have become property of the one who professes to already know what's inside. So that's my podcast on the leading statement. I know what you did. If you have a comment about this podcast or a question you'd like answered in a future episode, please let me know. You can drop me a line through the contact form at steveprentice.com. That's S-T-E-V-P-R-E-N-T-I-C-E dot com. And you can follow me on Twitter at Stephen Prentice, S-T-E-V-E-N-P-R-E-N-T-I-C-E. Instagram, Steve underscore P underscore online. And on LinkedIn, just search for Cool Time Life. No spaces, just as one word. If you like what you hear, please also consider subscribing and leaving a review. The theme music for Cool Time Life was obtained through podcastthemes.com. Until next time, I'm Steve Prentice. Stay safe, and thanks for listening.